you have this interesting encounter. Uh, Abraham and Sarah and their family, this clan, are really the beginnings of God's chosen people. Remember, God made the, the covenant with Abraham uh, and said that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. And so they are the origins of the chosen people. By the time of the Sinai covenant with Moses, though, and when he receives the commandments from God on Mount Sinai, uh, we know that Israel, the whole nation of Israel, is to be God's priestly people for the world. And among the priestly people, the tribe of Levi is appointed to offer sacrifices for God's people. But none of, that, none of that's happened yet, <clears throat> excuse me, and so uh, you have this interesting character, Melchizedek. He appears on the scene in this story, and then we don't see him again. In, in the Bible, we hear, he's mentioned a couple of times, uh, but long afterwards. Uh, so uh, who is he? Well, we're told he is a king and priest, and, and a king and priest of a place called Salem. Well, the word Salem meant peace. So it's very interesting when you put that together, king and priest of peace. Although Salem was an actual location, we, we, the scholars tell us now, it was the site of ancient Jerusalem long before it became King David's capital, long before he took it from the Jebusites. Uh, so you put all that together, you have a king and priest of, of peace who presides at Jerusalem, which will be David's city, the holy city. And uh, he is not a pagan priest. We're told that he is the priest, he is a priest of uh, the Most High God, which is an unusual expression to be used in the Canaanite region at that time. You know, you had all these different Canaanite gods. You had the Baal and the Asherah and you name it. But instead, he's the king of the Most High God, not any other gods. And um, he makes an offering of bread and wine, which is highly unusual, you know, an unbloody offering with the concept just is kind of foreign to their culture. And he serves as an intermediary between God and Abraham. Abraham has won a great victory. And so uh, he, he wants to, to, to offer a, a sacrifice to God in thanksgiving. And, and out comes Melchizedek who offers this sacrifice for him. And it foreshadows Jesus' unbloody offering of himself in the Eucharist. It also foreshadows the priesthood of Jesus, and through him, the priesthood of all of our priests today. You know, in, in our uh, responsorial psalm, we heard the, the refrain over and over again, which actually we also hear at the ordination rite of priests. You are a priest forever according to the line of Melchizedek. Today's psalm is really a messianic prophecy of Jesus. God says that a descendant of David, who will also be David's Lord, will be a prince and will sit at the right hand of God. But he will also be a high priest, like Melchizedek, who made the offering of bread and wine on behalf of God's people bringing down God's blessing upon them and offering their thanks back to God. And we're told at the end of that reading that Abram gave 10% of the spoils of his victory, a tithe to God. He was giving thanks. And we know that Jesus won the victory over sin and death just as Abram won a victory over his enemies. Jesus though was to be both the priest and the sacrificial victim offering all of himself to the Most High God, his loving Father. He now sits at the right hand of God as king and priest, interceding for his people every single time we offer this Eucharistic sacrifice at Mass. Jesus' offering was his own body and blood on the cross. He offered it sacramentally at the Last Supper, transforming the bread and wine into his body and blood in the Eucharist. And in our second reading, St. Paul gives us the oldest biblical record of the Last Supper. You might think that, well, wouldn't it, the, the accounts in the Gospel be earlier? Uh, no, not at all. St. Paul wrote his letters that we have in the New Testament long before, uh, between 20 to, to all the way down to about five years before uh, the, the Gospels were ever written, the first of the Gospels were ever written. 
And so uh, this is the oldest written version we have. And Jesus tells the disciples to do this in memory of me. He does this in an unbloody manner at the Last Supper. And we, along with the church throughout the centuries, take his words as they are, literally. It is the same offering that Jesus made on Calvary, commemorated each time we celebrate Mass. Our priests in persona Christi, the Latin term meaning in the person of Christ, stands at the altar to offer Jesus sacrifice for us once again, for our sins, for our salvation. This is the offering of the new covenant in the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. When we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes. We must receive this precious gift of Jesus then in faith, believing what the church believes and being truly repentant of our sins, making use of the sacrament of reconciliation when necessary. My friends, when you think about it, we're just like the hungry crowds in today's gospel. We come here to be taught about the kingdom of God, just as they came to Jesus to hear about the kingdom of God. And we come to be fed by the miraculous bread of the Eucharist. And what happens to us when we do this? Well, a good reception of Holy Communion does three things for us. First, it brings us into a deeper union with Jesus and with his body, the church. Secondly, it forgives our sins. And third, it increases God's grace and love in us. And so today, let our prayer be the same as the request of the crowds at Capernaum after this miracle. Sir, give us this bread always.